We will take our reading from a prayer written by St. Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. St. Therese writes, O Jesus, who in thy bitter passion didst become the most abject of men, a man of sorrows, I venerate thy sacred face, whereon there once did shine the beauty and sweetness of the Godhead. But now it has become for me as if it were the face of a leper. Nevertheless, under those disfigured features, I recognize thy infinite love, and I am consumed with the desire to love thee and make thee loved by all men. The tears which well abundantly in thy sacred eyes appear to me as so many precious pearls that I love to gather up in order to purchase the souls of poor sinners by means of their infinite value. O Jesus, whose adorable face ravishes my heart, I implore thee to fix deep within me thy divine image and to set me on fire with thy love, that I may be found worthy to come to the contemplation of thy glorious face in heaven. Amen. Again, words taken from the little flower. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Steve Jobs, God rest his soul. Steve Jobs was the marketing genius behind the famous Apple Computer Company. And in introducing the first Apple to the market, Steve Jobs, using a marketing ploy of sorts, had retailers price each unit at $666.66. An unusual price, to say the least. And when you combine this memorable price along with the symbol of the company, not just an apple, but a fruit that had been bitten, one can see just a little bit of rebellion, eating perhaps a forbidden fruit. It smells just a little bit like Jericho. Of course, Mr. Jobs was part of that baby boomer and Beatles generation. It's interesting that the record company that the Beatles founded back in the late 60s was also named Apple Records. Again, we see a little bit of a forbidden fruit there as a company symbol. Yes, the Beatles. Despite those men being baptized, they are truly icons, images of the revolution of man against the established order of Almighty God. Let me just mention a few points or two about this band, beginning with their famous White Album. Recall the fact that the Beatles themselves claimed that the majority of their lyrics, the words used for the famous White Album, were gained through TM, also known as Transcendental Meditation, where the band would take the lotus position and would have a lotus flower in their hands. They would meditate before a pagan altar, and they would groan using a certain mantra, some Hindu mantra, in order to be inspired by the pagan gods and goddesses, otherwise known as demons. And I'm sure they did yoga too. And they were very much a part of bringing TM, or Transcendental Meditation, to the Western world. And think about the effect of TM upon the band and upon the listeners to the White Album. One of the main hits of the album was the song Helter Skelter, which certainly influenced a man named Charles Manson, along with his twisted family of followers. I'm not claiming any direct connection, of course, but note that men have been inspired to do great good or great bad according to what they have read or listened to. I mean, if God can use Gregorian chant to lift men's souls to him, could not the devil use various albums to accomplish his designs? I mean, it's not out of the question. And furthermore, note the Beatles' famous album and single known as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. One of the lines from this musical piece goes like this. I'll spare you by not singing it. But it goes like this. It was 20 years ago today that Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. Now, who is this Sergeant Pepper? Well, if you count back exactly 20 years ago from the album's debut, you will find a date that marks the death of Aleister Crowley, 
who was well-known and even in some way a mentor of the Beatles. In fact, a picture of Aleister Crowley is displayed on the front cover of that album. Mr. Crowley, for those who may not know, experimented with many illegal substances. He was promiscuous in every possible way. A true libertine whose only motto, his only law was, do what thou wilt. That is the whole extent of the law. Aleister Crowley was also a magician. He was an astrologist. And he was very much into the occult and the black arts. And it's not surprising that Mr. Crowley was also a Freemason, for the god of the Freemasons is literally the devil himself, Lucifer. In fact, this hero of the Beatles was a full-blown Satanist. It was 20 years ago today that Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. And what sort of inspiration did the band receive? As I mentioned in Sunday's sermon, the book of Genesis, chapter 6 to be exact, there is made mention of individuals known as the sons of God. The so-called sons of God, tradition tells us, were actually the children of Seth. They were the descendants of Seth. And if you know your Bible stories, you know that Seth was the child born to Adam and Eve uh, after the murder of their child Abel by his brother Cain. And furthermore, tradition tells us that these sons of God, these children of Seth, were trying to remain faithful in this fallen world. That they'd actually made an oath to their father Seth that they would stay on the mountains and they would never descend, but rather they would try to climb upwards so they might hear at least the echo of the songs of the angels in paradise above. And such an oath was taken, as I mentioned, because they wanted to separate themselves separate themselves from the men who lived in the valley, namely the children of Cain, the first murderer of all. In the valley below, in the valley below, the children of Cain regularly feasted in gluttonous ways. They were often inebriated, and they were promiscuous and most lustful. And tradition tells us that Satan and the demons inspired two brothers, to make musical instruments into which the devils entered. And when the men blew into the instruments, the devils sang within the pipes and sent out sounds in order to compel the sons of God on the mountains to look down and even to descend from the heights. In hearing that devilish music, the sons of God started looking down into the valley. Because the music of Cain, the sons of Cain, was so rebellious. It was filled with volume, disorder, disharmony, and discord. Yet it attracted them because it appealed to their fallen nature, to their pride, to their sensuality, and their greed. And though they had sworn an oath never to travel downwards, the sons of God, the children of Seth, like so many Catholics today went down, went down the mountain to join in the rebellion against God in the valley. And there below, the children of Seth, the sons of Seth, saw the daughters of Cain, who were naked and they were unashamed. And yes, these men of the mountains were filled with lust. And the Bible tells us they took the daughters of Cain for wives and they slew their souls in the process. And once having fallen, when they tried to climb back up the mountain, God would not allow them to ascend. And after this event, as I mentioned on Sunday, the Bible records in the very next passage, it says that God, seeing the wickedness of men was so great, God repented that he had made man on earth, and God said, I will destroy man whom I have made. And thus we have the story of Noah and the worldwide flood. The rebellion. The rebellion in the once Christian West has overthrown the established order that God has willed, where his son is recognized as king of all creation, king of all men, and king of their societies. 
He is established in order where the Holy Gospel is supposed to be the law of the minds and hearts of men. And yes, he established a kingdom, which is the church that should be recognized by society as the one channel of salvation. The rebellion has brought nothing but disorder over the centuries. But then again, that is the very nature of all rebellious revolutionary movements. Destroy the old order and bring in a new order. But all it is is bringing in chaos and confusion. The revolution, the rebellion we speak of, actually began with Lucifer himself. Lucifer was the greatest angel that God ever created. But this angel, this angel named Lucifer sought a throne, sought a place in creation that was not rightfully his. Lucifer coveted a throne right next to the Blessed Trinity. But little did he know that that throne had been reserved for the sacred humanity, the very flesh and blood of the Son of God and Son of Mary. Much to Lucifer's dismay, not only was that throne taken, but also the throne next to it, which would belong to a virgin of Nazareth, to the mother of the God become flesh. Unwilling to accept this place, this lower place in the order of things, Lucifer cried out, non servia, I will not serve. And all of a sudden, 33% of the angels joined him in this rebellion, And they became demons. But two-thirds, two-thirds of the other angels led by St. Michael remained faithful to God and his Christ. They represent true Catholics. True Catholics, they represent what we would call counter-revolutionaries. And we know the result from the war from tradition and sacred scripture. Satan and his traitorous Angels fell, but they fell like lightning from the sky, but they fell to earth. The revolution, the rebellion is now here below. And men will either stay in Jericho, the city of man, whose end is chaos and hell, or they will be counter-revolutionaries who want to climb up the mountain towards the new Jerusalem. Whose side are we on? Because let's face it, the rebellion, the revolution is largely in control of almost every aspect of the public society. It has become the status quo. I mean, there's a mystic named Blessed Francis Palau, a Carmelite mystic of the 19th century that had a vision of all the thrones of the Western world, all the seats of power. And he said that all of them were in the hands of Satan. The devil, the greatest of blasphemers, is becoming ever more cocky upon earthly thrones. And he'll offer us the whole world if we will but bow before him. On December 8th, 1980, at 10.50 p.m. in the evening, Mark David Chapman shot and killed John Lennon, outside his New York City apartment. In regards to the Beatles' religion and their religious affiliations, John Lennon was a baptized Anglican, and so was Ringo Starr, the famous drummer, while Paul McCartney and George Harrison were baptized Roman Catholics. But having been brought up in homes where Christianity was not practiced, the band members eventually looked for inspiration elsewhere. But the inspiration they sought from false religions and atheism not only corrupted them, but it brought about a corrupting influence in their music. For those familiar with the Beatles, LSD, marijuana, and other drugs were included in their sung messages as they got more than a little high with the help of their friends. But perhaps the most disturbing was their false an anti-Christian message which no doubt influenced the baby boomer generation. John Lennon, for example, wrote that famous song called Imagine. Next time you might hear that song perhaps walking through a mall or some 
uh, department store, listen to the lyrics. Imagine there's no heaven, no hell below. Above us only sky. Imagine no religion too. It's easy if you try. And with the spirit of the world in him, as opposed to the Holy Ghost, the singer adds, imagine all the people living only for today, never for the future. Certainly, there's no inspiring thoughts of heaven and eternal life in the world to come in this song. As for George Harrison, he ended up becoming a Hindu. And he wrote a number of songs in which he praised his sweet Lord as Hare Krishna and opposed the one and only Savior of men, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then there was a song written by Paul McCartney about the demise of the Catholic Church. It was called Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby, the song goes, Mr. McCartney tells us, lives in a dream world of her Catholic faith. As for her pastor, Father Mackenzie, he writes sermons that no one will hear because no one comes near. And then towards the end of the song, Father Mackenzie offers a funeral mass for poor Eleanor and then does her burial. And the lyric goes, Father Mackenzie wiping the dirt from his hands as he walks from the grave, no one was saved, unquote. And for those who may doubt that the Beatles had a very anti-Christian message and actually an agenda, allow me to quote from an interview given by John Lennon and Paul McCartney in Newsweek magazine. Christianity will go, John Lennon says. It will vanish and it will shrink. I don't need to argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus Christ now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity, unquote. In an interview with, let's call it an adult magazine, Paul McCartney said, we probably seem anti-religious, and that's because none of the band believes in God, unquote. Well, John Lennon is now dead. He's been dead now for more than 35 years. He's vanished from the surface of this earth. And as for the Beatles, no one will even know their name a hundred years from now. During the Advent season of 2015, just a little while ago, the Catholic news agency recorded a horrendous sacrilege that occurred in the country of Spain. The Catholic news agency reported that a Spanish, quote-unquote, artist named Abel Ascona had stolen more than 240 consecrated communion hosts over many months by pretending to receive Holy Communion at Mass. The same quote-unquote artist then placed the sacred hosts on the ground of a museum to form letters that spelled out perverse words. Abel Ascona who lives an alternative lifestyle, no coincidence, I guess, is known for his anti-Catholic positions. In a recent interview, he sneered, religion is at the same level as cancer or AIDS, and in fact has killed more people than these better-known diseases, unquote. When a private citizen, when a private citizen sought to make reparation, when a private citizen reacted against this blasphemy and sacrilege by gathering up the sacred hosts laid on the ground and taking them to a nearby parish, this artist responded with mockery, noting that he still had a whole vessel filled with hosts back at home. The guilt for this heinous crime not only falls upon this homosexual artist, but also on the whole city of Pamplona, Spain, which officially sponsored and hosted and paid for that art exhibit. When I read about this desecration of the most blessed of all sacraments on the Internet, I was immediately reminded of that story told by the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen 
the story about an act of Eucharistic reparation performed by an 11-year-old Chinese girl. One day, the story goes, a group of red Chinese communist soldiers entered a village and they arrested the Catholic priest and they made his own rectory a prison. The communist soldiers then went into the church itself. They overturned statues. They broke windows and mosaics. And they then boldly went into the, to, into the sanctuary itself. The soldiers then pried open the tabernacle using a crowbar. And inside the tabernacle was a ciborium, a gold vessel holding 32 sacred hosts. The priest actually knew the exact number. The soldiers threw these sacred hosts upon the floor. They then walked out and put a padlock on the front door, and they thought that Catholicism would never be practiced again in that town. What the soldiers did not realize, that an 11-year-old Chinese girl had witnessed the entire incident as she lay hiding behind a column. The girl eventually snuck out of the church, but she left one of the windows partially open. And so the next night, the girl returned. She's only 11. She returned to the church, and she climbed in through that window that had been left partially opened. She then made a Eucharistic holy hour, a holy hour of reparation before Christ scattered on the ground. After praying, the girl approached the Holy of Holies. She then got down on her knees and literally went down to the floor and consumed one of the hosts using only her tongue. The 11-year-old then went out the window only to return the very next night to do the exact same thing. A holy hour of reparation before Christ upon the ground, getting down on her knees and consuming the Lord using only her tongue. She did this for 32 consecutive nights until all the sacred hosts were consumed. But on the last night, this young girl fell from the window on the way out and a noise was made causing the soldiers nearby the rectory to chase her down. They then beat her with their rifle butts until she breathed her last. That was another martyr for the true faith in China, and yes, a martyr for Eucharistic reparation. But she's now on top of the mountain. When we think of the second commandment of the Decalogue, we tend to focus in on that sin which dares to abuse, to misuse, or to mock the holy name of God. But there are other forms of blasphemy, including the mockery of the true religion and rejecting the Christian order of things that God has established in Christ, as well as attacks upon the Blessed Sacrament, the Holy Mother Church, the Blessed Virgin, and all the saints. With this sin of blasphemy, God's rights have been violated. Whether modern man admits it or not, there are such things as divine rights, the rights of God. In our modern world, people are always talking about human rights, the rights of man, the Bill of Rights. But let me just take a moment to give you a definition of what rights actually is so we understand what a true right is. A right is something based on justice. A right is something that is good and moral. A right is a just claim to something that one is entitled to. Therefore, innocent persons do have a right to life. Starving persons do have a right in justice to food. And yes, sick and injured people do have a right to be cared for. But unfortunately, people today often claim a right to do that which is morally wrong. But no one has a right to do something wrong. I mean, there's a reason why we call it a right, because it's the right thing to do. A newspaper reporter does not have the quote-unquote right to libel others in his columns. And furthermore, there is no such thing as abortion rights or the so-called rights 
of same-gender couples to marry or civilly unite. One does not have a right to say whatever he wants to, claiming freedom of speech, when that speech happens to be a series of lies or destroys the reputations of others. And no one has a right to worship a false god or to practice a false religion. Again, no one has a right to do something which is wrong. But in all this talk about rights, and we hear it constantly today, it is interesting that hardly anyone ever speaks about the rights of God. Pope Leo XIII, the great Pope of old, Pope Leo XIII once wrote in his encyclicals, he said, we've heard enough of the rights of man. It is time we hear about the rights of God. In the modern world, it seems that the rights of man trump the rights of God. When prayer is forbidden in schools, God's just claim to be worshipped by his creatures is overturned by mere human courts. The removal of nativity scenes or Ten Commandment monuments from government buildings is a criminal attempt to remove God from the public square when in fact the public square is a creature made by God ultimately when human courts and human judges claim a right to split marriages apart or to redefine marriage itself, they are going directly against the Son of God, who is the very creator of marriage. God has a right to have a special day of the week in his honor, and all human laws on earth must seek to promote this right by making Sundays a day of worship and rest where any unnecessary labor or unnecessary commercial activity is forbidden. And God has a name, a name that is above every other name, and he has a right not to have that name abused with coarse or especially blasphemous language. And it ought to be noted that God also has the right to have his Christ, his anointed one, his only son, recognized and acknowledged as the ultimate Lord of creation. Now, I could go on. I could go on and give you many further examples of the rights of God, but I want to end this conference with a very important private revelation that dates back from the 19th century. That is, I want to tell you about a special message that our Lord gave to a Carmelite religious sister. He provided her a special message that she was to give to the world. Now, private revelations, just to make sure we understand that, are not in any way additions to the holy faith. Rather, private revelations help us live the unchanging faith in our time. In 1840s, 1843 to 1847 to be exact, a Carmelite nun named Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre saw a vision of Saint Veronica. You know, the Veronica from the Stations of the Cross. And she saw a vision of Veronica wiping the face, wiping the spit and mud from the face of Christ with her veil as he traveled towards Calvary. Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre was then told that sacrilegious and blasphemous acts committed in her day, the 19th century, were adding to the spittle and mud that St. Veronica wiped away on Good Friday. And Jesus told the nun that he wanted new Veronicas to wipe, venerate, honor, and adore his holy face. And the first message of our Lord was actually given to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre on August 26, 1843, just one day after the great feast of St. Louis IX, King of France, who was not just the great crusader against the infidel, but also a great crusader against the sin of blasphemy. St. Louis once stated that the best way to deal with a person who blasphemed was to run him through with a sword. The Savior stated, quote, Blasphemy is a frightful sin that wounds my heart more grievously 
than all other sins, unquote. With blasphemy, the sinner curses Christ to his face. He attacks Christ publicly. He rejects salvation, and he pronounces his own judgment. Our dear Lord then added that mankind's unwillingness to respect the holy name of God and to cast insults and blasphemies towards the Most High were like poison arrows striking him in the face. This is why our dearest Lord gave Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre the famous golden arrow prayer, a prayer that is lovingly aimed towards the Son of God and wounds him delightfully, thus healing the wounds inflicted by sinners. And that's why we're reciting the golden arrow prayer each night to open our mission conferences, to wound him delightfully in his holy face. In a later revelation, our dear Lord came to that Carmelite sister and told her another thing that caused him great pain, namely profaning and abusing the Lord's day. He said, the Jews crucified me on Friday, but Christians are crucifying me on Sundays. They crucify him by violating the third commandment. And that is why Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre was asked to make communions of reparation for those who violated the third commandment. All these public attacks upon the Holy Name, the Lord's Day, as well as public attacks against the true religion and the Holy Roman Church were adding up and would soon submerge the world in the wrath of God. The Son of God then spoke of his anger, the anger he felt towards those men who ignore or reject the first three commandments, which have to do with our relationship with the Almighty. Jesus stated to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre the following, quote, The earth is covered with crimes. The violation of the first three commandments has irritated my Father. The holy name of God is blasphemed. The holy day of the Lord is profaned. These sins have risen to the throne of God and provoked his wrath, which will soon burst forth if his justice is not appeased. But our dear Lord later added that the chastisement, the punishment that he would send to the world would not necessarily be natural disasters like earthquakes or tornadoes, but rather what he called, quote, the malice of revolutionary men, otherwise known as the communists. They are the ultimate revolutionary liberals. Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre received these revelations between 1843 and 1847. In 1848... Karl Marx would publish the Communist Manifesto. We were warned. And is there any doubt in our minds that this punishment, the malice of revolutionary men, has and continues to inflict us, to afflict us because of the public crimes against the rights of God? Russia has spread her errors. She has not been consecrated. She has not been converted. And therefore, the world still suffers from the malice of revolutionary men. Public blasphemy, public mockery, and public insults towards the good Lord demand public reparation. Our blessed Lord spoke again to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre, stating that he... The Son of God comes as an ambassador to us, and he urges us to make reparation and to honor his Father. If this is not done, if irreverence and impiety continue, if we neglect his terms of peace, the Son of God, the divine ambassador sent from the heavens, threatens, and these are his words, to declare war 
on man by grave punishments. Now, what does reparation mean? Because we should start doing it. Reparation means to make amends for the wrongs that we have done, to repair somehow the damages that we have caused. It means making up with greater love for the failure in love through our sins. In short, to give Jesus a kiss of love in order to counteract the blistering kisses of various Judases. If we have ever shown him ingratitude, we now give him more and full thanksgiving. If we have ever overindulged in a life of sin, we now practice greater penance and self-denial. A quick example of reparation at work. Remember, not too long ago, being in a choir loft in a church. And as I was in the choir loft, I saw a fully habited nun come into the church. And she was up towards the front, just outside the sanctuary. And for ten minutes, I witnessed her genuflecting over and over and over again. And I'm talking perfect genuflections with great devotion, with great exactitude and preciseness. Now, ten minutes, she decided to walk out, and I ended up following her. And I said, dear sister, I saw you in there. You made beautiful genuflections to our Lord, but so many. What was the reason? And she said, I wanted to make reparation. Reparation for all those times in my past when I carelessly genuflected or quickly passed in front of the Most Blessed Sacrament without even recognizing him at all. Now, modern devotions today rarely, if ever, speak about reparation. Catholics today are constantly speaking about mercy, compassion, and pardon coming forth from the Savior without mentioning the sacred heart that has been pierced by men's ingratitude. And so we see images of the laughing Christ, but rarely do we see images of the suffering face of Christ in Veronica's veil. Well, let me inform you of a message given to Sister Lucia of Fatima, one of the visionaries. Our dearest Lord said to her that blasphemies aimed against Almighty God or the Immaculate Heart of Mary, quote, will not be pardoned by divine mercy without reparation, unquote. No mercy without reparation. In other words, those who are stuck in Jericho, those who are stuck in the Jericho of this world, those who may mock or show indifference to the good Lord, are in danger of falling into the abyss of hell unless someone makes reparation for them. The divine wrath will manifest itself and punishments will come unless reparation is made. There's a restaurant down the States in the city of Baltimore, to be exact, and the name of the restaurant pub is called the Ale Mary. A-L-E, the Ale Mary. This inappropriate title is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to blasphemy. You see, inside the bar, you have, in addition to the liquor, the wine, and glasses, you also have a series of chalices that can be used by patrons as vessels of choice as they down their draft beers or margaritas. Besides old chalices, the bar also has a monstrance near the whiskey that is strewn with Mardi Gras beads. At one time, the Luna had held the most blessed sacrament, but now that little window in the monstrance has a picture of a smiley face with a mustache. Many other restaurants throughout the United States I would assume also in Canada and in Europe, use old church items purposely. They use their communion rails to make their bars, altars to make tables for the restaurant. And as well as using rare doses, the high altar rare doses, not to display devotional statues, but to display expensive brandies or ports or cordials. 
I was just not too long ago in Columbus, Ohio, and I went out to lunch with a priest, a good priest, and we went to the spaghetti factory. And all of a sudden we came in and we noticed that they had couples tables for maybe dating couples or married couples or newlyweds, but they were actually former confessionals that had been turned into seating areas for twosomes. Listen, O Western world, wake up. The handwriting, as they say, is on the wall. In ancient days, the Babylonian king named Balthazar ate and drank with his lords and ladies using the golden vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. But in the Old Testament, we know that all of a sudden, an angelic and mysterious hand appeared and began to write of the nation's destruction on the wall. The strange message was Mene Tekel Perez. The prophet Daniel was called in to decipher these strange words. And with divine enlightenment, Daniel warned the Babylonian king, your days are numbered. You have been weighed into balance and you have been found wanting. Your kingdom will be divided and it will be conquered. You have blasphemed the Lord using the vessels of the temple, but no one is here to make reparation for you. Therefore, there is no mercy for you. The modern world is now in a very similar predicament with blasphemies aimed against the good Lord, with ingratitude and indifference towards his loving care, reparation must be done that we might receive the full flowing of divine mercy. But in these modern times, we're not listening, including the hierarchy. In modern times, many optimistic churchmen talk about new spring times, new Pentecosts, at the same time, these individuals disagree with the views that they label of those who are prophets of doom and gloom. Let's always be enthusiastic, they tell us. But what has heaven's message been for the last 200 years? It's a constant, continuous message from heaven that the hierarchy is not listening to. What was the message of our Lord to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre? divine threats, and calls for reparation to the holy face. What was Our Lady's message at La Salette? Heaven sent punishments and appeals for penance. What was the message of Fatima? Whole nations will be annihilated. Russia will spread her errors, do penance for sinners, and pray the rosary for peace in the world. What about the message of Akita, Japan? Our Lady told Sister Agnes of Akita back in the 70s and early 80s, fully approved by the local church there, that fire would come down from heaven to punish mankind unless reparation is done. And all these fully approved apparitions, without exception, there are threats from heaven but also there's solutions given from heaven on how to avoid it. Sister Elena Aiello, she was an Italian nun, and she received also private revelations from Our Lady in the 1950s. Recently beatified by Holy Mother Church, Blessed Aiena Aiello received visitations. Our Lady appeared to this nun with tears in her eyes stating that, quote, people are offending God too much. Men cover themselves with filth, but they don't confess their sins, unquote. The Blessed Mother also told Sister Elena Aiello that the sinful condition of modern men, this is the 1950s now, the sinful condition of modern men was much worse than that of the men during the time of Noah before the worldwide flood. Worse than that back then. If men do not do penance, Our Lady stated the following will happen. This is a conditional prophecy. It's a warning. She says the world will once more be afflicted with great calamities, with bloody revolutions, 
with great earthquakes, with famines, with epidemics, with fearful hurricanes, and with floods from rivers and seas. But if men do not return to God, our Lady warns, a purifying fire will fall from the heavens like snowstorms on all peoples, and many members of humanity will be destroyed, unquote. Heaven's message has been very consistent. No age of peace, no mercy until there is reparation. And these acts of reparation will either be voluntarily done by men who fall to their knees and pray to the good Lord for mercy and forgiveness, or it will come in the form of men being forced to their knees, stiff-necked, stubborn men being forced to their knees to make reparation. But here we have what is called a conditional prophecy. It might happen or it might not happen. Something that could be even lessened. We're not talking here about the major chastisement that happens at the end of the world. That's part of absolute prophecy. We're not talking about the rise of the Antichrist and the second coming of our blessed Lord. No, rather, we're dealing with the present threat, a present danger of a chastisement, which we would call a minor chastisement. And furthermore, we're dealing with the present condition of being in the chastisement right now. We are suffering from the malice of revolutionary men. They have been the scourge of the earth. They have been overturning the Christian order and putting chaos in its place. We kill our own offspring. It's extraordinary what they've done over the centuries. Even Holy Mother Church and her members has been infiltrated and infected with this malice of revolutionary men. How can we be freed from this miserable condition we find ourselves in? And how can we possibly avoid or lessen the threatened punishment that might be sent our way? All the means are available, and it doesn't take much. I mean, dear people, if only ten, only ten God-fearing men have been found in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities would not have been destroyed by the hand of God. Who's going to be like Abraham then? Make reparation and bargain with God. Who will be like Moses, who will stand in the breach and hold back the wrath of God upon the people of God? Who will be like Christ crucified, who will cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Which of us will make reparation for our sins and those of the whole world? The city of Nineveh was literally saved from complete annihilation, not because God changed his mind, but rather because the inhabitants of that infamous city changed their ways. They responded to the prophet Jonah and they did reparation for their sins and they were saved from destruction. Well, you have someone far greater than Jonah here this evening. The divine ambassador truly is physically, corporally, substantially present in the most blessed of all sacraments. We have an image of his most holy face, an image a copy of that veil of Veronica present in St. Peter's Basilica here near the pulpit. He's a divine ambassador, and he's offering us conditions for peace, and that's what he wants. And if you and I here this evening begin to embrace our Lord's call to be adorers like Veronica, soothing our dear Lord's holy face by wiping it and venerating it, then perhaps we could lessen or even eliminate this threatened punishment. I'm so happy that every Tuesday here, you have devotion to the holy face of Jesus. What a blessing for a parish to have that. Devotion to the holy face will save the world. Miracles will be worked. Sinners will be converted. And yes, our own disfigurement of soul caused by our own sins 
will be made beautiful once again. Turn to us, O Lord. Let us see the face of your Christ, and we shall be saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We will take our reading from the book of Psalms. Great is the Lord, and exceedingly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. With joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, founded on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. In her houses shall God be known when he shall protect her. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God hath founded it forever. Again, words taken from the book of Psalms. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Michael Crichton is a famous, or should I say was a famous author, a best-selling author, in fact, with many of his books, like Jurassic Park and Andromeda Strain, being turned into big Hollywood movies. As for his religious beliefs, Mr. Crichton was uncommitted. But before he passed from this world in the year 2008, Michael Crichton did have enough wisdom to see that a new false religion or spirituality was present in the world today, namely the religion of environmentalism. In a controversial speech, Michael Crichton, the author, stated, quote, Today, one of the most powerful religions in the world is environmentalism. Environmentalism seems to be the religion of choice for urban atheists, unquote. Although not a religious man, Mr. Crichton noted that the spirituality of ecology had come to embrace many religious ideas. The best-selling author, for example, observed that many environmentalists have their own creation story. They speak of a golden age, an Eden-like past, where men were truly one, not with God, of course, but with nature. Men saw themselves as just another species, not better than anything else on earth. But then it happened. The original sin of the environmental creation, a story, where men polluted and littered, for the first time. After the fall, Mr. Crichton states that men have now become, quote, energy sinners, doomed to die unless we seek salvation. And salvation is called sustainability. Sustainability is salvation in the church of the environment, just as organic food is its communion, unquote. In such a religion or spirituality, the liturgical color is always green. Recycling becomes literally a corporal work of mercy, and separating plastics and paper is an act of almsgiving which forgives a multitude of past pollution sins. There are also evangelists of sorts in this particular religion, evangelists like Rachel Carson, who tell of the good tidings of a future free of all pesticides. There are also martyrs in this quasi-like religion who will lay down their lives for the sake of a redwood tree, or will even advocate self-murder in order to save the earth. Ecological high priests, and that's not an overstatement, Environmental high priests and preachers even speak of an apocalyptic future filled with gloom and doom unless we limit our carbon footprint. And for those hunters who would dare kill a noble beast or predator, they are deserving of being put in an incineration furnace or at least a compost pile. Penance, they tell us. Penance Penance, penance must be done because of our crimes against nature. We are all in need of what is called an ecological conversion. 
as one environmentalist stated not too long ago, human beings as a species have no more value than slugs. Another activist. Another activist claims that the human race has become a virtual plague upon itself and upon the earth and that it, quote, might take our extinction to set things right, unquote. Therefore, prayers, prayers of sorts are offered up by ecological high priests begging that the right kind of virus will rain down upon humanity and decimate it. Now, the religion or the spirituality of environmentalism blames Christianity. It blames Christianity first and foremost because of Christianity's influence on civilization. It blames Christianity for all the ecological evils because Christianity holds that human beings are special, that they are different in kind, not just in degree from all other earthly creatures, that men are meant to be stewards of material creation, that human beings are meant to subdue and master the earth. We teach that one human soul is worth more than the entire universe, and that the loss of just one soul is worse than the entire destruction of the material universe. But let's face facts. These environmental ideologues are simply pantheists at heart. Consider what one wacko environmentalist wrote. Man, he writes, is the most insane of creatures. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature, unaware that the nature he's destroying is the God he's worshiping, unquote. They're pantheists at heart. Now, for those who may not know, pantheism is an ancient religious outlook that makes little or no distinction between the creator above and the creatures here below. Under this view, God is not transcendent. He is not supreme and above all. Rather, God is in all. And in fact, all is literally God. It is a notion that God is not just everywhere, but literally everything. From the largest star to the smallest molecule, everything is God. And so God is not this personal divine being, but rather the term, quote unquote, God constitutes all reality. As the former head of the Soviet Union, if you wonder where he's been, the former head of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, had this to say, quote, I believe in the cosmos. All of us are linked to the cosmos, he says, so nature is my God. To me, nature is sacred. Trees are my temples. Forests are my cathedrals. Being at one with nature is my goal. Yes, the religion. The religion of spirituality, of environmentalism, is nothing but old pagan pantheism or Shirley MacLaine rubbish. How far have we traveled down the road to Jericho? Western man is now fully back in the valley. We have fallen from the heights of Jerusalem and a Christian culture to the depths of a new paganism. As St. Paul writes to the Romans, he wrote, For professing themselves to be wise, they became fools who changed the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature instead of the creator. And wherefore, God punished them. He gave them up to the desires of their hearts, unto uncleanness, to dishonor their own bodies amongst themselves, unquote. Having set up created idols in the valley, in the valley of Jericho, we behave more and more like the beasts that we now worship. Because most in the modern world are no longer climbing upwards, 
they fail to see the height of human dignity and the supernatural life that we are called to. But this is not just a disservice to mankind, lowering and devaluing we who are made in the image of the Most High, but it is also a rebellion against the good God in whose image we are made. You see, in addition to speaking about climbing the mountain of God, we have mentioned over and over again the rebellion, the revolution in the once Christian West that has overthrown the established order that God has willed with Christ as king, his holy gospel as law, and his kingdom, the Catholic Church, as recognized as such. And this rebellion has brought nothing but disorder and chaos. As I mentioned last night, the satanic revolution started in the heavens above with Satan, with Lucifer, but it came down to earth below. And men on earth are now faced with a decision. Either they will stay in Jericho with the revolution, which ends up in chaos or in hell itself, or they will be counter-revolutionaries, fighting the evil all while climbing upwards towards the true Jerusalem. Again, we ask the same question we asked last night. Whose side are we on? For the revolution is largely in control of things. It has become the status quo. Blessed Francis Palau the great Carmelite priest, mystic, and hermit, Blessed Francis Palau once had a vision where he saw all the thrones of power and seats of government in the Western world in the hands of Satan. And he was a man of the 19th century. I wonder what he would say now. The devil, the greatest of blasphemers, is becoming ever more cocky upon an earthly throne. And he offers us the world if we would but join in his revolt. And when men have joined in his revolt, he will then use them as his instruments in blaspheming the good Lord and his blessed mother. Case in point, Adam Daniels. Adam Daniels heads a small group of Satanists who sponsored a black mass in Oklahoma back in 2014. Not satisfied with this blasphemy, Mr. Daniels offended and insulted the very mother of God this past Christmas Eve. Dressed in a bishop's cassock with an upside-down pectoral cross hanging from his neck, Mr. Daniels poured fake blood over the statue of our Blessed Mother, fake blood that had been treated with sulfur and ash. The outrage took place right outside St. Joseph's Old Cathedral on December 24th, 2015. Before the actual event, the Oklahoman, which is the secular newspaper, described the upcoming atrocity as if it were nothing more than a small political rally or an artist's display. The Oklahoma newspaper wrote, the protest will be confined to the sidewalk and will not block any church entrances, according to the permit obtained by Mr. Daniels. The permit also requires them to clean up the display and to ensure that no fake blood is left on the sidewalk, unquote. Welcome to our modern day country. Our modern-day America, where the government allows all the public blasphemy one cares to commit as long as such mockery of the sacred falls within the limits of a city-issued permit. Daniels, the Satanist, called his blasphemous event the following, quote, the virgin birth is a lie, unquote. That was the title of his protest. The purpose of the blood being poured on Our Lady is to add, he said, another layer of corruption to Mary, which is an emblem of the Catholic Church, unquote. Daniels, who was also a convicted sex offender, 
had built an altar to Satan using the rubble from the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. He said the rubble was good material for his altar because it had a lot of negative energy. Furthermore, Daniels was able to erect an actual statue of Satan for public honor and veneration. The goat-headed image sits enthroned while two carved images of children attentively sit nearby and listen. Some might choose to ignore these outrageous acts of blasphemy, but as our Lord told Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre, that nun I mentioned last night, as he told her, public desecration demands public reparation. The devil and his followers have a special hatred for the woman, a special hatred for Our Lady. In fact, a lot of salvation history is based upon a feud, a feud, an enemy relationship between Our Lady and Satan. In chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, the good Lord states that he will put enmity, an enemy relationship between the woman and the serpent. And this feud will continue to the very end of time, as we see from the book of Revelation. The very last book of the Bible, we're in chapter 12. There is made mention of a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, with the crown of 12 stars, and yes, chased by a red dragon who seeks to devour her child and all her spiritual children. And yes, remember, remember the message given to Sister Lucia, one of the visionaries of Fatima, who said that the Virgin expects Satan to increase his desire to enter into conflict with her in this modern age. And that the conflict between the two increases as each year passes. The devil's rage against the Blessed Mother is based upon her essential role in salvation history. It was based upon the fact that she said yes. She consented to be the mother of the Savior. And as a result, the devil has been forever defeated. The head of the serpent has been crushed by a woman. Well, the devil, he may be damned forever but he still desires to somehow get back at this woman, to show her disrespect and to bring her spiritual children away from her. In fact, insulting Our Lady in her sacred images, such as pouring blood on one of her statues, is one of the five blasphemies aimed against her most immaculate heart. It demands reparation. On December 10th, 1925, Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucia, again one of the three visionaries from Fatima. But along with Our Lady was also an apparition of the divine child Jesus who was sitting upon a glowing cloud. The Holy Virgin then showed her immaculate heart to Sister Lucia. The heart that she held in her hand was beautiful to behold, and yet it was encircled and pierced with thorns. Our Lord, the divine child, then spoke to Sister Lucia, asking her to have compassion upon the heart of his mother, which, quote, ungrateful men pierce at every moment, and there is none to make an act of reparation to remove those thorns, unquote. The Virgin then spoke to Sister Lucia, stating that the thorns in the heart of the Virgin were actually the blasphemy shown by men towards her, and that she, she wished to be consoled by men who practiced the first five Saturdays, the five first Saturdays, where Catholics would confess their sins they would visit the Most Blessed Sacrament. They would receive Holy Communion. They would recite the Holy Rosary and would keep company with the Mother of God for a quarter of an hour, all while meditating upon the mysteries of the Rosary. And why was this done? These acts of devotion in order 
to make reparation, or in other words, in order to remove the thorns from her heart in return for those those individuals who would console her in this way, Our Lady would be with them with all the graces they needed in their last agony on earth. Now, Sister Lucia, being a lover of the Most High and the Blessed Mother, was eager to begin this work of reparation. But she questioned our Lord about the purpose of five first Saturdays. Why five? In response, the Son of God stated the following. The reason is simple, my daughter, our Lord states, because there are five types of offenses and blasphemies committed against the Immaculate Heart of my mother, including blasphemies against her Immaculate Conception. Number two, blasphemies against her perpetual physical virginity. Number three, blasphemies against her divine maternity and her universal motherhood over all men. And number four, blasphemies of those who publicly seek to sow in the hearts of children especially contempt and even hatred for the Immaculate Mother and five, as we know, showing her great insult directly in her sacred images, her icons, and in her statues. Before there can be any peace in this world, true peace, before there can be truly a triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart, those thorns in her Immaculate Heart must be removed. In other words, reparation must be done. These blasphemies, these offenses are also threatening mankind, as we heard last night, with the greatest punishments if they are not repaired. The work of reparation comes before divine mercy flows in abundance. St. John Eudes, the great French priest of the 17th century, St. John Eudes used to sign his letters in the heart of Jesus and Mary, signed Father John Eudes. In the heart of Jesus and Mary, that's how he closed his letters, Note the use of the singular instead of the plural. This was not a grammatical mistake. That is, this priest was making a strong spiritual point, namely that the heart of Jesus was present in the heart of Mary. That is, the virtues of the heart of Christ, his love, his mercy, his generosity, his meekness, his humility, his courage was also present in the heart of his mother. It is impossible to separate the two hearts. That's why, in essence, they're one heart. It would be easier to separate the sun from its heat or from its light than to separate the heart of Our Lady from the heart of her son. This is why we should never be afraid to approach our Blessed Mother, for Mary has been fully transformed by the power of our Lord's grace. She is, as it were, transparent. You can see right through her. It is not she who lives so much, but rather Christ who lives in her. And therefore, if you and I want to be meek and humble of heart, if we want hearts made like to that of Christ's heart, then let us quickly and confidently come to Our Lady because she has His heart to give us. If you wish to reach the height of the mountain of God, if you wish to see His holy face, then find this goal by journeying through the highest peak on the mountain which is the Blessed Mother, the highest member of the church. Another French priest, a French priest that many of us know, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, he once made a very bold statement about Our Lady. He said that Mary should be the very center of our spiritual lives. Our Lady should be the very center of our spiritual lives. Now, at first, this sounds somewhat unchristian, for isn't Christ to be our central focus? 
Well, St. Louis de Montfort would certainly agree, but he insisted that Mary is the center insofar as she is the best means, the best way of coming to our end, which is union with Christ. If our goal is to come to Christ and to be in union with him, then the best way of arriving there is through his mother. And hence we have that wonderful spiritual phrase, which we could live our whole spiritual lives by. Ad Jesum per Mariam, to Jesus always through Mary. But you know the devil knows this formula too. To Jesus through Mary, he knows that formula. And in their wicked attempts to show irreverence and blasphemies towards our dear Lord, they will often mock and offend the Blessed Mother, attack Jesus Through Mary, bring down our lady, you bring down our Lord. You see, if you can stain the mother, you can stain the son, at least in the minds of men. And so if you deny or mock the fact that Mary was conceived without original sin in the the womb of her mother, St. Anne, then you can bring insult to the son. Because then we can say that somehow... Oh, the devil had Mary before Jesus did. The blasphemy is connected with denying or mocking her perpetual physical virginity before, during, and after the birth of Christ. Mocking that ends up being infinitely offensive towards the Son of God, who the prophets of old told us was to be conceived and born of a physical virgin, and that he was to be the only begotten child, just as Isaac was the sole promised son of Abraham. And of course, insulting or even questioning her divine maternity ends up casting doubt on the very divinity of the Son of God and the Son of Our Lady. You see, any public irreverence given to Mary, any public contempt or scorn shown towards the mother passes on to the son. Such evil is not only outright blasphemy, but it also corrupts the minds of the young. They begin to despise religion, despise piety. As I mentioned yesterday evening, before the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart, before there can be an age of peace and a universal reestablishment of the Christian order, reparation must be done for these crimes. Thorns in Mary's Immaculate Heart need to be removed. You see, what is this triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart? Why do we do the five first Saturdays? What is this triumph It is ultimately the triumph of her son. It is his universal reign of peace in the minds, hearts, and yes, public societies of men. His gospel being in the hearts and minds and nations of this earth. As the Latin phrase says, Coriesu adveniat regnum tuum adveniat per Mariam. Heart of Jesus, may your kingdom come. And may it come through Mary. Or as St. Louis de Montfort said, it is through Our Lady that he first came into this world, and it is through his mother that he will reign in this world. Most of mankind, even many of our neighbors perhaps, are on the very edge or the abyss of hell. Many of us are near Jericho, the lowest city on earth. Modern man is spiritually impoverished. The smoke screen of secularism, the fog of liberalism, the haze and smog of modernism within the membership of the church hides the mountain of God from our eyes. And therefore, men of the modern age are becoming ever more base and even bestial as they dwell in the valley below. Modern man is devolving. He is not evolving. Men are becoming more cruel, more violent, more disordered. And for those modern men 
who do seek elevation, who want further enlightenment, they often seek man-made, new age means, climbing false towers, towers of Babel, in order to achieve it. To paraphrase the journalist G.K. Chesterton, it's not that modern man doesn't believe in anything. The problem is that modern man believes in anything. And I will just put that to an example here. The example of Shirley MacLaine, a Southern Baptist at one time. Shirley MacLaine was born in the 1930s, grew up in a Southern Baptist home. Of course, we know her because she's famous as a Hollywood actress, Academy Award-winning actress, in fact. But perhaps she's most known today for her New Age spirituality, where she seeks to further enlighten her mind so that she can become the God that she already is. Presently, she lives in the mountains. She seeks mountaintops, too. But she lives in the mountains of northern New Mexico. For as she puts this, this location gives her a better opportunity to channel the energy forces of the cosmos and to be in harmony with the God that is all creation. In her journey towards having divinity come out, McLean often consults various Far Eastern gurus. She also consults, at least she says she has, extraterrestrial beings in their UFOs. McLean also believes in reincarnation. In fact, Miss McLean gave birth to her only daughter many years ago, and she remarked when she gave birth the following, when the doctor brought my child to me in my hospital bed, I wondered if my daughter had lived many lives before with other mothers. Had she, in fact, been a mother herself? Had she, in fact, been my mother? Was her one-hour-old face literally housing a soul some millions of years old, unquote? The New Age movement, unfortunately, is gaining further and further ground in the Western world. It is now mainstream. Whole New Age sections of Barnes and Nobles. Yoga is now the basic exercise for the masses. Everything is mainstream. You see, when men seek to throw Almighty God out of their lives, something always will take its place because nature abhors a vacuum. Human beings are spiritual creatures, and if they're not being supposedly fed by Christian spirituality, they will find any spirituality to take its place, even the ridiculous. In New Age spirituality, there's no personal God, because a personal God might expect something from us, but rather there is a divine force, a divine energy out there that can be used for good or be used for bad, kind of like a force, light or dark. Like environmentalism, New Age religion is pantheistic. It is called the New Age movement because of their belief that there will be a new age, a new time period in history where it is about to begin, the dawning of an age of Aquarius that will bring about true enlightenment of the human mind. They use channeling devices like astrology and crystals, aliens, genies, gurus, mediums, witches, and even demons as channeling devices. And by doing this, they will reach their true potential as being divine without the Holy Trinity being involved at all. Of course, man doesn't need a savior in this system because there is no sin in the New Age spirituality. There's no heaven, there's no hell, but rather a series of reincarnations until you finally reach total union with nothing, with the universe, nirvana. Men wanting to be gods, that has been our problem from day six. <laughs> from day six, we have had trouble. Men wanting to be gods, wanting to become divine without God being involved. Human beings want something good. We truly do. 
We want the highest good in fact, but often we go about it the wrong way. To be godly, to be holy is a good goal, but human beings often use the worst means to achieve this goal. Almighty God, the most holy trinity, that supreme being, which is totally beyond this creation, wishes to make us gods, at least with a small g. He does. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost wish to bring us into their divine communion and fellowship. The good Lord wishes to give us a created share in his own divine life. But God demands that we attain this unbelievable supernatural height by going about it his way. Human beings are creatures. We're infinitely below the Most High, and we cannot come to perfection. We cannot be godly without him. We are nothing of ourselves. Remember our origins. You are dust. You are the mud, the slime of the earth. But God can do a lot with dust. We need to go back. Our Lord he would always say when people got things wrong, he would always say in the gospel, in the beginning it was not so. If you made a mistake, go back to the beginning. In the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent spoke to Eve. The devil's temptation was a perfect one. He turns to the woman, suggesting that if she were to eat the forbidden fruit along with her husband, they would have good things. But Eve states that she will not eat of the fruit because that would bring death to her and to Adam. The devil then responds, you shall not die. You shall become gods. Your own way. You shall become gods. He offers for that temptation. Notice the devil offers a good goal. It's just the wrong way of going about getting to that goal. By breaking God's commandment, his request of his children. In their sin, Adam and Eve wished to bring themselves through their own devices to the very heights of perfection instead of depending upon their creator. Our first parents sought self-direction instead of God's direction. God had made Adam and Eve immortal beings, created in the state of grace, they were godly. They were immaculate without stain. They were filled with divine knowledge. And they were the stewards and masters of creation. And all of creation was perfectly subject to them, obeyed them. They were filled with divine knowledge. Thrones had been prepared for them above and for all their children in heaven. But the pride of our first parents... Their disobedience caused them to fall from the heights, to lose their grace, to lose that share in divinity, to lose paradise, and to gain a world of sin, suffering, and death. Adam went, to Jer went from Jerusalem to Jericho in an instant. But then came the Good Samaritan. Then came the good Samaritan, the Son of God, descending from the heights of heaven, from the heights of that Jerusalem above, to the depths of Jericho here below. He came down to rescue us from the power of sin and death, to bring us back into that divine communion which we had with him in the beginning. We don't believe in reincarnation. It is pure foolishness. But we do believe in the incarnation. The mystery of God becoming man in Mary's womb. The word becoming flesh and being born at Bethlehem. Many saints have used this phrase and it's not an overstatement. God became man in order to make men gods. Small g. God became man in order to make men godly, to become his children by grace. 
The Almighty has always willed to unite human beings with himself, to share his life, his fellowship that he has with the Trinity. And if we sought this goal in a bad way in the past, if we sought this goal in a sinful way, the good Lord now mercifully forgives us and he offers us life anew. It's as if God states, I will become like you in order to make you similar to me. I will share in your humanity in order that you might share in my divinity. Christ, our Savior, offers a new age for us. For the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. In Christ, there is a new beginning, a new creation, the dawning of a new age where men see their full potential of being one with Christ, the new Adam. But in this new age, Almighty God demands that we once again seek divinity and we seek perfection His way. In total subjection and dependence upon Him, that we use His means of getting there, His way to attain godliness, including the channel that he has established. Not gurus, not mediums, not aliens, not crystals, but rather his mother. She is the channel that brings us to the fullness of Christ. In Mary's womb, literally, not only did God become man, but man became God. In Mary's womb, heaven and earth came together as one. In Mary's womb, the heights of Jerusalem, the depths of Jericho were united. And so, if we truly wish to become godly and good and supernaturally virtuous, realize that we can have it. Realize there is a dream that we have beyond all of our imagining. We can enter into the family of God, literally. We can converse with angels and heavenly beings. We can become holy and one day in heaven sinless. We will even have angels serve us. We can ascend well beyond Mount Olympus. We can go to Mount Zion. And if we want all that, then go to the Blessed Mother. Come into her spiritual arms and her spiritual womb, for she is the divine channel. She is that channeling device that brought God down and can bring men up. I want to end this final conference of this mission with a story of Catholic nuns Catholic nuns who knew and loved our Blessed Mother, and they loved the Catholic faith enough to die for it. Although they died at the hands of French revolutionaries, their willingness to climb, to climb the scaffold and to embrace martyrdom brought them to the mountaintop of heaven. The French Revolution, as you know, was a time where Satan reigned over the people of France. One of the aims of the revolution was to de-Christianize the country. Does that sound familiar? To take Christ and the church out of France. Instead of the cross, the people would honor the liberty tree. Instead of worshiping the Son of God, they would honor now the goddess of reason. Instead of seven days in a week with Sunday being the Lord's Day, they would have a decade of days, nine days of work, and a tenth day of rest to honor and worship reason. No child born was allowed to have the name of a saint. And if anyone resisted this new order, if anyone resisted this new way, these changes, they would face the full wrath of the revolution. Mass shootings, mass drownings were the first methods of execution that were used against those who resisted change. But then the revolutionaries found a better way to kill, namely the guillotine. The guillotine with its sharp blade, 
It was quick. It was clean and allowed a bloodthirsty crowd to be entertained. So many thousands of victims had to place their necks below the blade. So many thousands were killed by the leaders of the revolution that the blood of the executed soon drenched the public square. The worst and bloodiest time during the French Revolution was known as the Reign of Terror from the summer of 1793 until the summer of 1794. Executions were happening daily with a new execution every minute. And it was during these difficult days, these difficult days for the church in France, that a group of nuns decided to offer themselves as victims, victims of reparation, a holocaust, to appease the wrath of God and to restore peace to their country. God accepted their offering. Great crowds would come out every day, for they saw the executions as a form of entertainment. But on July 17th, 1794, that loud crowd, that crowd that had mocked victim after victim, was put to complete silence. Because into the square, in a cart, being brought to the guillotine were 16 nuns in full Carmelite habit. The nuns were not filled with fear, but they were singing in anticipation of their martyrdom. They're dying for the Catholic faith. They've been arrested, they've been charged, and they had been brought to the guillotine for living the Catholic faith, praying together for living in community. The crowd was dumbfounded as it heard the nuns chanting hymns, the songs of the church that many in the square remembered so well. And when the cart arrived at the guillotine, the 16 nuns lined up to be executed one after the other. The nuns first individually renewed their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience before their mother superior. And next, each nun turned to their mother superior and asked the following question, quote, May I have permission to die, mother? The mother superior then stated, Daughter, permission to die is granted. Then each nun individually climbed the stairs of the scaffold and voluntarily placed her neck under the blade. And as their blade fell, there was one less voice. But the other nuns kept singing with joy until the final martyr breathed her last, and the singing on earth, at least, had come to an end. The crowds that day went away to their homes in complete silence, with tears in their eyes. The reign of terror in France would soon come to an end because the wrath of God had been appeased by reparation. As those nuns climbed the stairs to the guillotine to face execution, they were climbing the mountain of God with their crucified Savior. Let us all be willing to follow them for the love of the Son of God and His holy face. And yes, for the love of this one holy Catholic Roman and apostolic church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.